Hello, and thank you for tuning in today for two discussions about a topic that will play a critical role in determining how successfully our country emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can rebuild our economy in a way that is more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable for the long term. Like so many challenges, the crisis of affordable housing in the United States has reached a level of unprecedented urgency in the last couple of years. Amid the pandemic, and the increasingly urgent threat of climate change and natural disasters. Even before the pandemic forced us to reshape our thinking around how we live and work and altered America's infrastructure, housing stock, and urban centers, challenges related to affordable housing were representative of larger economic issues in our country. Home ownership is a fundamental way to build assets, develop generational wealth, and create thriving communities. You only need to look at the disparities between home ownership rates in white communities versus black, Latino, and Native American communities to understand that our economy historically has not been structured in a way that works for everybody. It's clear that we need to build a better, more resilient economy, one where individual success is not determined by which zip code you're born into. Boosting America's affordable housing stock in a way that widens the circle of opportunity while grappling with the impacts of climate change on communities all across our country, will be a critical component of this work. As with all CGI events, the goal of today's event is not just to talk about these problems, but to do something about them. We all have to find ways to help level the playing field for our economy, and I hope you'll come away from these discussions with some ideas about how you can take action to help achieve true impact. Today, I'll be joined by three individuals deeply involved in these efforts. First, I'm so grateful for the chance to speak with Marsha Fudge, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, about how the Biden administration is working to develop more affordable housing options and address racial disparities in home ownership rates. Secretary Fudge and the HUD team have been at the forefront of the administration's efforts and I'm really looking forward to hearing her ideas and insights. Following that conversation will be a discussion with two longtime members of our CGI community, Priscilla Almodovar, CEO of Enterprise Community Partners, and Zach Rosenberg, CEO of SBP. They're both working to create affordable housing that can weather the current and future challenges posed by climate change. I know all of you are eager, as I am, to hear what they have to say. So let's get started. Secretary Fudge, thank you for joining yes. me today. And uh, yes. thank you for your service. I'm glad you're where you are. Uh, thank you. Let's talk about a few of the big issues here. Uh, even at a time when home mortgage rates were quite low, the racial gap in home ownership persisted. And it's now uh, the largest it's been, I think, in 50 years. Uh, what do you think we can do about it in terms of policies and are there policies we can implement that will that don't have to be passed by Congress? First off, thank you so much, Mr. President, for having me. And I think that that is the absolute right question as it relates to where we stand today. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to say to you that uh, President Biden and, and Vice President Harris have asked every single uh, secretary to look at all of the work we do through a lens of equity. You are absolutely right that the gap between black and white ownership is larger today than it was 50 years ago. But as you also know, Mr. President, it is, it is all a part of the system. It is by design. It is not something that just happens by happenstance. Uh, there, are, there are barriers and roadblocks all along the way for black and brown people to have access to the same kinds of, of mortgages that non minorities have access to. And so what we're trying to do right now is to start to root it out. So let me just tell you some of the things we've done that we believe are going to be helpful. We know that starting with just the appraisal of properties, 
properties in black and brown communities are appraised at 20 plus percent less than those in white communities for the same basic home, same basic kind of neighborhood, but if just one is black and one is white. So we have lost billions and billions of dollars in equity in our communities. And those same communities are the ones that are redlined. And we still do have redlining in this country. We still do not make loans in certain kinds of communities for properties that are under $100,000. So the first thing we did is say to uh, FHA and those partners that we have, we're going to start to make those loans again to ensure that we can start to rehabilitate communities. As well, what we determined was that Black borrowers in particular carry as much as 40, 45% of them carry student debt. We know that that has been a problem because student debt has been weighted higher than any other kind of debt. So what we've done is recalculate what student debt means and how much we can afford to risk in student debt loans. So we know that we have helped thousands and hundreds of thousands of people neutralize their student loan debt so they become credit worthy. We also know that one of the biggest issues in uh, home buying for black and brown communities is the down payment. Most of us do not have parents who have generational wealth. And so the down payment becomes an impediment. So we're looking at doing down payment assistance. The president, not only in his Build Back Better plan, but as well as in his 2023 budget has requested almost $100 million just for down payment assistance. So we know with these things, we can make it better. But Mr. President, you know as well as I do, we have not invested in housing in this country for more than 50 years. We have not built enough housing, whether it be public or private, we just have not built enough housing. And so the market is so skewed that even people under normal circumstances who might be able to afford a home can no longer do that. And so we have, by design, segregated poverty in our country. And until we start to put more housing into the market, the situation is not going to change. And so our goal is to, through the Build Back Better or parts of it, build as many as 1 million new housing units over the next five years. Uh, we're trying to do 20,000 by the end of this year through some financing we have through housing finance agencies. We know the problem. We just need the commitment and the will to solve it. Well, uh, let me ask you a specific question about that. When, um, when I was in office and we, my party lost the Congress and we couldn't pass some of the things I would otherwise have liked to pass, one of the best tools we had for addressing the racial gaps in home ownership was the Community Reinvestment Act. And it's been on the books since the <clears throat> mid to late 70s. But when I left office, well over 95% of the lending that had ever been done under it was done in those eight years. And it amounted to putting $800 billion, which was real money back in the 1990s, uh, back into the communities in terms of home ownership. And we were, we were so successful that uh, the conservatives tried to blame our administration for the housing crisis saying, well, we wrote home mortgages for all these people that didn't need it. And unfortunately for them, the Congressional Budget Office had done a study which said that banks compliant with the Community Reinvestment Act were actually less likely to fail than banks that were out there gambling. So are there, are there banking regulations and other things that you can access today that will help address this problem? No question about it. We are looking now with all of our partners at where we have failed with the Community Reinvestment Act, and we know that we have. We know that there is so much more we can do. The other thing we're doing is looking at special purpose credit uh, loans. We know that for years and years, banks did not believe that special purpose credit was legal. So we've now made that determination and have notified every single partner and every single bank and lending institution in this country that they can start to focus their, intent, their, their um, attention and be intentional about making loans to underserved communities. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is that if we look at 
all of the things we have used, the tools we have had in the past. You know for yourself, we have a Congress that is not as, as um, what will I say? is not as concerned about people who live in the communities that we're talking about. And so we are trying to pull some of those things out, but it is difficult because we can't, number one, get the funding that we need. I mean, there's no way today with the funding that we receive from Congress that we could even do half of what we need to do. And so we rely on the things that we can do as an agency, as well as the things that are already in law. So I think that CRA is gonna be very, very important And we are trying to figure out how we can use that tool in a more effective way. How are you going to get the evaluation gap closed? I agree with that. That's a big problem because even um, one of the things that always frustrated me is even when we got incomes growing faster in minority communities, the wealth gap persisted. And the lowest hanging fruit in the wealth gap is getting rid of the racial discrimination that's in the valuation of housing. That would have a huge, almost overnight impact on the wealth of African-American and other minority communities in the country. So how, how are you going to do that? Mr. President, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Uh, President Biden has tasked me with being the co-chair of a task group that we're calling PAVE, which is the Property Appraisal and Valuation Equity Task Force. We will be rolling out a report in about two or three weeks that clearly shows the bias in the appraisal process, but also makes recommendations as to how we solve it. One of the things we know is that appraisers tend to be, at 95%, tend to be white males who do not live in the communities that, that they actually appraise in. And so until we can start to diversify the appraisers, that's number one. Number two, make sure that the tools that we use are fair, which they are not. Uh, So we've got some things that we're going to be recommending that we think can start to change the process. And, And I tell this story all the time, and it actually is in our report. I live in a home in an all black neighborhood that is two doors from an all white neighborhood. My house is larger, my lot is larger. And my house is valued at $25,000 less than my neighbor. So I'm losing hundreds of thousands of dollars every few years. And and so it it starts to constrict what I am able to do because of the lack of that equity in my home. But we believe very strongly that when this report is released, it will just lay bare what we have known for a very long time and the solutions that we believe can start to turn it around. Well, I want to wish you well with that. I, I, I believe that most people, even those who would be listening to us, who tend to be far more well-informed about such things, I don't think they understand what a big problem this is and how literally, if you can solve this, it may not make big headlines. It may not you know, require a big bill or give you a big bill signing, but it... In the short run, it would do more to remedy the wealth gap by race than just about anything we could do. And I, I applaud you for it, and I'll be cheering you on. Uh, let me ask you another question about this. How can we, if we build more housing, are you confident we can get people to finance it for homeowners? who have been left out and left behind? Of course, Mr. President, our mission at HUD is to provide medium cost affordable housing. We have three problems, three major problems. One is where we can build housing because you know as well as I do that part of the problem we have is that there are many communities who say they want to help and take the stress off the market by allowing more affordable housing in, in, in their area, but they don't want it in their backyard. So we have to look at the zoning and planning that has for a very long time uh, been a major problem. Secondly, the cost of housing today is so high 
because of the supply chain, obviously, especially now with COVID. So what we have done is, is recommended to the Congress, and some of it the president is working from his end, is to increase the housing trust fund, which is basically for the lowest of, of low income. We have raised the cap and the amount that you can use for LIHTC so that low income housing tax credits will be an incentive for builders. We are looking at various types of housing, whether it be factory built housing or uh, modular housing or um, manufactured housing, because we know that that brings the cost down as well as they are more energy efficient than the building we do today. And they can be done very quickly. So we're looking at alternatives as to how we go about putting more housing in the market. We, we um, are now once again using the Federal Financing Bank, where we are actually giving resources to housing finance agencies at almost zero cost so that they can loan and start to fill the gap for the cost of building and what it costs to sell it. CDBG money, which you know very well, CDBG is, is in, in our home, money makes it very um, flexible for us to use those resources as well for gap funding. So we're doing our part, the part that we can do, we are doing. We just need to encourage communities to work with us and encourage builders to find ways to keep the cost down. And the planning and cities need to look at, at what they are doing to be impediments. I mean, something as simple as, you know, you have to have a concrete driveway instead of an asphalt one. You, you, you have to build your house out of brick or something. You know, there are just so many different things that are creating the problem that we just are trying to address them one by one. And so I'm talking to mayors every day, literally every day. I spoke to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, talked with the governors. We are working to the best of our ability. And the president have, has requested about $10 billion to invest in talking with cities and counties and states about their planning and zoning to make the process smoother and easier, more effective and more cost efficient. Well, th thank you. One, one of the things that I've always been frustrated by is uh, how difficult it is to get people to follow models that work. And I'll just give you one example because I think it's very important for what you're trying to do. I know you're concerned about making uh, the housing stock of the country more climate resilient, more resistant to the, the challenges that climate change is bringing to us. Uh, after Katrina, uh, I worked uh, in the New Orleans area for a long time. I worked with uh, first President Bush. We raised a lot of money and then I continue to work in a lot of those areas. And in, in the Lower Ninth Ward, one of the architects we work with built all these houses uh, that were built way up off the ground as they should have been. But since he was building a new, he'd be built with enormous energy efficiency. And I remember, this had been well over a decade ago, we had a, a woman, uh, a black woman with two kids living in a home which was much nicer than the home that she left before the flood. And uh, she had just had a $27 electric bill in July in the hottest month ever recorded in Louisiana. And she was talking about all the money she'd saved. She said, it's just like I got a huge pay raise that I'm not only in a nice home, but because it's energy efficient, I have more disposable income for my kids. I'll, I, I'll never forget it. And I just kept saying, well, surely everybody's going to start using these technologies now, but it doesn't happen. And that's another thing I think that your emphasis can make a difference on. We are very focused on climate change. We are very focused on resiliency and sustainability. I'm glad that you mentioned the Ninth Ward because I think that people do not always understand that it is generally underserved communities and poor communities that are affected most by these devastating storms that we've been having. Uh, and they're not going to stop. They are becoming more and more frequent. 
And so what we find is that people who can least afford it are losing everything. So if we don't start to focus on how we address climate change and how we can, if nothing else, just retrofit existing uh, properties so that they are more sustainable, more energy efficient, then we're going to continue to spend the kind of resources after every storm that we should not be spending. And I think that because utilities is such a huge part of, of persons who really are struggling, it is a, the, one of the huge impediments as well to owning a home. Most people can't afford the utilities. So to hear that story says to me that we're on the right track because that is what we are trying to do now. Anything that we are building or any time that we are dealing with disaster relief, we are looking at energy efficiency, we are looking at sustainability, and we are looking at resilience. So we are on the right track. There's about $60 billion being requested in the president's budget and in Build Back Better, because we know that this is something we cannot continue to put off. It also creates a ton of jobs. <laughs> and there are jobs that can never be exported. I mean, I, 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 the, our new mayor in New York City, Eric Adams, has met with the uh, Empire State Trust, you know, the Empire State Building and part of a trust. They, I think they own 44 or 45 buildings. But uh, several years ago, they asked us to work with them and they, the, they created 275 jobs in the Empire State Building alone, just changing the lighting, the windows, the insulation, the whole nine yards. But if you look at a lot of these very simple homes, there are things that aren't that expensive that can be done that will lower their electric bills and increase the incomes. So if you can get them properly evaluated, you increase the wealth. Then if you can cut down the cost of operating them, you increase the incomes. I think it's an enormous opportunity for you, and I'm so glad you're working on it. You know, Mr. President, I have, you know, I've heard you speak many, many times over the years. I've been in your audiences many times. And the one thing that always sticks with me, which we are talking about today, that you've been talking about for more than 20 years, is that we have to start building things in this country. Because that is a part of the problem with the job market. But more importantly, as we're looking at housing supply now, if we built those things in this country and people here had those jobs, we would not be in the situation we are in today. I mean, back when you first started talking about this, you used to say things like, the only thing we build is cars. We don't even build whole cars anymore. And so we have stopped the manufacturing base that has sustained this country for a very long time. So we are getting back to, as you say, what works. Uh, President Biden is determined that we are going to build more things in America. And I think that is the one thing that is going to get our economy back where it needs to be. They are good paying jobs, they are secure jobs, and we don't need to outsource those jobs. So I am hopeful that over the next year or two, we will see significant increases in people working in manufacturing in this country again, because if we don't take the opportunity we have now, I don't know that we will ever have this same opportunity again. I agree with that. Uh, one of the things I would like to say uh, and I say this as a citizen, not a former president, but, uh, you know, there's lots of evidence that if we can build housing units that help to integrate communities, both racially and in terms of economics, we will have more productive communities, the kids will do better in school, there'll be less racial tensions. We just had a, a local race in this little town where Hillary and I live in New York that was all about whether we should have another affordable housing project here. Because we have a lot of middle-class people, a lot of first-generation immigrants, and a lot of upper-income people. And we built a low-income housing unit, ironically, near the railroad track. I thought we were dissing the poor people because they'd be there by the train track. But they built it with an amazing technology, which both made these units quite attractive and apparently relatively immune from excessive noise. And it's doing pretty well now. And we've got another one nearby. 
And one of the things I think that those of us who support you should do uh, in communities throughout America is volunteer to ask our fellow citizens to support our building and living together more because we want all these kids going to the same schools. We want them to have the same opportunities. And I think that every example we can create of that makes it very hard, at least much harder, to downgrade the value of black people's homes or brown people's homes or anybody else that's, you know, seems to be out of the mainstream of American economics. You know, Mr. President, you're absolutely right. But the other thing it does is it encourages people to invest in the community. Right now, when you have communities that are solely disadvantaged, then you don't see the same kind of investment in schools because most education is funded by property taxes. So they don't have the resources to invest. You don't see the same investment in roads. You don't see the same investments in police and fire. You don't see the same investments in just overall care because they are communities that people tend to forget. So when you integrate communities, then you find that you see the, the value, not only the value of homes coming up, but the value of people increasing because everybody in that community now has the same goal, which is to make sure their, their, their children go to better schools, that their communities are safer, uh, that their roads are paved. So everybody in this country, Mr. President, wants the same thing. You know, they, they want to be sure that their children will get a good education. They want to live in a safe and decent place. They want a good job so they can take care of their families. Everybody wants the same thing. We just have to figure out how we can pull this country together enough to make it happen. You know, everybody wants to take care of their parents, but nobody wants to pay extra taxes to do it. Nobody wants to let you build an accessory dwelling unit so that you can take care of your aging mother or father. We have to talk about all of those things. Uh, and as I get older, of course, aging in place becomes very important. But if we can put all of those people in one community, then I think we can see what really is the American dream. And I hope that at some point we get there. Well, first of all, you just proved why I think it's a great thing that you are where you are. But uh, I've noticed in the last, let me talk about politics generically here. I've noticed in the last two election cycles, there's been an attempt to divide the American people and to scare suburban voters who otherwise tend to be a little more progressive with what they have to lose. You know, that's what all this uh, socialism, critical race theory, all these things are done. What I think is interesting is I think we ought to flip this and say we should be trying to build a society where everybody's got something to lose and therefore everybody gains by protecting and working together and building together. And that's what I see with uh, these housing projects. If you do it right, uh, then everybody's supporting the schools and everybody wants them to work. And school board meetings are places where you resolve what the appropriate age is to teach X, Y, or Z, or should this course be taught or all of this rhetoric. We have got to build and knit this country together again. And I think doing it around homes and neighborhoods is quite apart from all the basic economics, it's a huge part of making people think they own a piece of the American dream and, and having their neighbors respect and work with them. I think it's really, really important. I agree hundred percent, but I also say this too, Mr. President, we have to start to tell the truth about what is happening in this country. You know, anytime we allow 200,000 veterans to sleep on the streets, 
500,000 people to sleep on the streets homeless. We have to start to tell the truth, but we also have to start to ask the question, is this one America or two? Do we wanna have a rich and poor, a black and white America? And until we start to do the things that you just talked about, that is what we are going to have. And I don't believe that everybody in this country wants that, but we just have to make clear to them that that is what we have until we can start to all come together and that everybody does have something to lose. Well, thank you. I also would, I, I wanna give you just a little chance before we run out of time to uh, say something about the homeless problem specifically and what you're attempting to do about it and uh, whether it's one problem with a fairly straightforward response or whether it's a whole lot of problems that are just manifested by people not having a place to spend the night. Well, I really am happy to talk about homelessness in this country. It is something that is a priority for HUD, for me, and for the White House. Anytime in the richest nation in the world, you let 580,000 people sleep on the streets, it is a sin. It is a crime. It is a travesty. Today, the problem is more finding permanent housing. You see, we have people in Congress, Mr. President, who believe that you should not help people who have a drug problem or who have a mental health problem. Our belief is that you put people in stable housing and then you start to deal with their problems. It's the housing first approach that we know is proven to work. But we need to start to use the resources that were given to us through the rescue plan. It's $10 billion. And prior to that, everybody ignored the problem. It's no different than driving up the street and every day seeing a homeless encampment. After a while, it becomes invisible to you. And so until we are intentional about how we address the problem, the problem is going to exist. I don't know if we will ever do totally away with homelessness, but we can put a huge dent in it with the $10 billion that came out of the rescue plan and just our own humanity. We can make a difference in the problem because the fastest growing groups of people sleeping on the street today are families with children and senior citizens. How do we not take care of the most vulnerable people in our society? And so we have to make a decision that it is important enough for us to do it. We have to get all hands on deck. The mayors are now committing to us that we are going to get so many homeless people off the street in our city by the end of the year. We have about 80 partners between mayors, um, native councils, governors, county officials saying, we're going to do our part. And once we continue to do that, I think we put a dent in it. But if we are out here on our own and we are the only people working on the problem, then it will never get solved. I agree with that. I, I just wanted you to be able to say that because I think it's a, these people are all part of our country and they are, a lot of them have had really terrible <laughs> luck and terrible things happen to them, but they should be, given a chance to have a decent life. And a lot of them need mental health support. They should have to have, they should get mental health support. But for many of them, it's just pure uh, naked, one bad thing after another economics. And so I think that the rest of us should not begrudge having physical facilities that are decent for homeless people to move into and have apartments and finally get in a position to earn an income and pay for it. But in the meanwhile, they ought to have a roof over their head. And uh, again, I would say, I, I think that you have this job at a very challenging time, but also at what I hope will be a very rewarding time because I think you clearly are committed and you're, I've, we've known each other for years and been friends a long time. I think you're, you're the right person at the right time in the right place. And I just hope you get the support you need. And if there's ever anything we can do, just know you know you got two big fans in our home. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. President. First of all, I, I want to start with Zach. I, uh, I still remember so well being with you on the 10th anniversary of Katrina in New Orleans and looking at some of the work you were doing in housing. And I want to thank you again. But give us an update. Where is, uh, where is your work in New Orleans now? What have you done and what are the consequences of it in terms of both climate resilience and energy efficiency and reducing the carbon footprint. Thank you, Mr. President. It's great to see you. I remember that day so well. And I'm thrilled to tell you that SBP has made tremendous progress, not just in New Orleans, but around the country since that day, uh, six and a half years ago. SPP sees, Mr. President, the work that we're in being disaster resilience and recovery as being the combination of three of the biggest issues of our day. This notion of what home means, climate change, and racial equity. Disaster resilience and recovery sits firmly in the middle of that. I'm happy to tell you in a moment about one of our, um, a project that we feel most proud that indeed uh, is now sitting uh, less than 80 yards from where we were that day. But I do also need to tell you that SBP is engaged in resilience and recovery work at a system change level across the country in the Bahamas and now in St. Vincent, where we're doing great work together, turning the ashes that devastated that island into construction brick that will then be able to rebuild uh, the community with that which destroyed it. SBP is engaging in system change work designed to help the governments access the federal money and get it out the door in a way that prioritizes outcomes as importantly as compliance, really prioritizes speed. What else do you ask about resilience uh, and fortification? So 80 yards from where we were that day at our headquarters in New Orleans, which was a public-private partnership as part of a new market tax tra uh, credit transaction, we've built St. Peter which is the first net zero apartment building in all of Louisiana. 50% uh, of the units are reserved for veterans. Uh, it's mixed income. So you and the secretary were just talking about the best way to defeat bigotry is through proximity. People have to live together and they make incredible neighbors. We have built this building that is deeply resilient. It was inspired by Toyota's um, creation of um, a visitor center in a national park that was powered by uh, solar panels and stored the energy in Toyota Prius batteries. We partnered with Entergy, which is, from our view, one of the best utilities in the country, to make sure that St. Peter was not only energy efficient, but was resilient. And it was tested this summer. So when Hurricane Ida came, and when much of New Orleans lost power for weeks on end, the state lost power in some parts for over a month on end. Our residents, like Mr. Eddie and Mr. Sherman, uh, two US veterans, one of whom came directly from a recovery center, the other uh, who was living on the street after serving our country for seven years, had cold air and hot water and didn't have to be evacuated um, very perilously. So we are thrilled with St. Peter, who was actually through the partnership with architects and uh, the builder, less expensive to create than traditional affordable housing. And with intentional usage of uh, their utilities, residents have de minimis electric bills every week or every month, and they're able to put those savings towards other necessities of life that position them for greater success. And also, and this is important for people of lower income levels, gives them some dominion and control over their daily existence. So I wanted to share that opportunity in St. Peter with you. Happy to talk more, but Priscilla has much fascinating work that uh, Enterprise is doing. I wanna make sure she has as much time as possible too. So Priscilla, what are, where are you in this space? Tell us what Enterprise is doing. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. It's great to be here and thank you for including um, Enterprise. So I agree completely with, with Zach and I will say that 
I'm sure you saw, Mr. President, that last week the UN's Intergovernmental Climate Change Panel came out with their report. And it was alarming. Uh, basically, it's telling us that all the time we had to mitigate climate risk, that we're running out of time. So I think the timing of this conversation is incredibly important. Um, and it's based on the climate reality. I mean, last year we had 20 extreme climate events. It cost the U.S. government $145 billion. As Secretary Fudd said earlier, and you and your prior panel, it's low-income communities, those living in poverty across the globe that are the hardest hit, take the longest to recover. And the other finding, which is very in sync with what Enterprise is doing is, is that in addition to cutting emissions to meet all the goals that are being set across the world, we also have to adapt. And that they call it the adaptation gap. And what does that mean? That's a lot of the work that Enterprise is doing is so we work in the multifamily real estate space. Um, in this country, uh, a third of the households are renters. 60% uh, of them are low income. Uh, they're cost burden. People of color, as Secretary Fudge mentioned, tend to be renters, not homeowners. So we're very much focused on the affordable housing industry to make sure that the industry, but also the residents that we serve are not left behind. So adaptation is very important because the housing that they're living in is 40 years old. Uh, it can't withstand these extreme climate events. There was just a recent study from Harvard that eight, I think it was something like 18 million units or 40% of the stock, if there were a disaster today, would either be destroyed or wiped out. So if there's two crises going on, what Secretary Fudge mentioned, we need more units, they would be wiped out. So it's super urgent and adaptation is a big part. So our work, we take a three-prong approach grounded on successes we've had um, with moving our industry. And one is we have to educate. We need to educate real estate developers, cities, urban planners, investors, you know, what is climate resilience? Folks don't quite yet know what that means and what they can do about it. So it's about withstanding a climate event so that your building and the residents that live there are protected and are not displaced. So just education is a very big part. And then the capacity building, making sure we give them the how. So, you know, these our best practices are happening. How do we make sure they're scalable? So adapt education is a very big part. Once we have them, then we focus on assessment and adapting and making sure they know the strategies that they could implement to uh, fortify their building. So we've created some incredible tools. One of them is Project Protect. It's a free tool. You can type any address in the United States and it will tell you the hazard of that particular asset and, and provide you the strategies of what to do. And what's unique about this tool is we have the data. We recently, uh, put the C uh, CDC's data, the social vulnerability index, because part of climate ad adaptation and resilience is what are the social factors of that particular community? There's some na there are neighborhoods across the country that don't have the networks that are required for the people to, to, to recover when a disaster hits. Uh, hit. So having these tools, we do resilience academies, educating, making sure that capacity is there. And then the third part of our work is that when a disaster does happen, and it will happen, is that these neighborhoods recover, we accelerate the recovery, and they're able to build with the practices that we know that work. So our, our hope is that you know, the IPCC's report was, was dire. However, it brings that urgency that this, this, this body of work needs across all levels of government. And our hope is that climate resilience becomes the norm and not the exception. So as, as hard as this work is, we're hopeful that our industry, the real estate industry knows what to do. We just need the will to actually get it done. Well, let's dig down on that a little bit. I, uh, as you know, I'm fascinated by this subject, but I'm also endlessly frustrated. I remember, uh, I visited the first carbon positive office building in the Netherlands more than 15 years ago. I saw the first carbon positive office building in Athens, Greece, well over a decade ago. And I still remember eating dinner on top of my hotel uh, and looking down 
and seeing a, a mile of cars from mostly Greek citizens a mile long just to drive by the building to see it. There was fascination. There was eagerness to embrace it. Um, and it's much cheaper now and easier to both increase the resilience and reduce the carbon footprint of buildings than it was then. Why are we so slow on the uptake here? And it's not just America, but we are particularly uh, slow. And I want to ask, since Zach complimented energy, and uh, I was glad you did. The, they're old friends of mine, and the president of the Arkansas affiliate is a woman whose father was my White House counsel and my lifelong friend. So I, how, what is the problem with the slowness of the transition? I, I wanted to mention one other thing. This is, we just finished a couple of years ago, the third decade in a row where insurable energy losses related to climate change tripled. And now it's, it's going to be worse in some places, but as the country. So what's the holdup? Why is it just that there aren't enough people like you guys? Is it, uh, or, or there aren't enough utilities that are willing to speed up how to manage their unrecovered costs? Explain it to people so they can understand. It seems like such a no-brainer that we should be doing what you're doing, and we're not. I agree with you, Mr. President. I will give this example. You know, 15 years ago, Enterprise tried to do what we're trying to do now with electrification on greening. There were a lot of skeptics. Today, greening affordable housing has become mainstream. We came up with the standard called Enterprise Green Communities, which is a step-by-step -step guide of what you need to do to build healthy, environmentally sustainable housing. There were a lot of skeptics at first. And you know, it's a whole issue of who pays for it, what's the return on investment. In our industry, there's that double issue of, does the landlord get the benefit or the resident? So there, there were issues. So what we, what, we do, what we did is education was a big part. What was greening affordable housing? Um, and bringing stakeholders together, the professionals, the architects, the design experts, building the capacity. Once we convinced people they could build green and have a better asset, it was a technical assistance, and then it was capital. And I have to say, when it came to greening, it was philanthropy that had to step up for us to get developers to convince them that they should do this and, and prove the concept of what enterprise was, was, was really believing could be done. At the time, it was very focused on energy efficiency. Today, we have updated the standard where it has electrification, indoor air quality, insulation. So we, the industry, we've evolved the standard as the industry has evolved. But it was philanthropy who stepped up. And then we found some progressive developers who did what we were hoping they would do. And then it was up to us to show the, the, re, the cost benefit analysis and why this made sense. And then the systems changed, what Zach mentioned. Once we proved the concept, that's when we got state governments to take our standard and make it a condition to government programs. Today, I am proud to report that our enterprise green community standard is adopted by 30 states. It's either mandatory in some and others, it's an incentive. You get higher points if you, if you build to that standard. Today, there's 130,000 homes that are certified under the enterprise green community standard. Those homes that are certified every year, it's like taking 20,000 cars off the road. So this stuff works, but it took, looking at the entire system and it took time, it took philanthropy for us to then convince city and state governments. HUD works very closely with us now. So our goal is that electrification, reducing emissions becomes the norm, the way now green standards, I think Zach, I think you would agree. I think our industry has evolved where now it's an expectation. So that's, it takes a lot of will and effort. So Zach, I don't know, you, what if you probably have Stuff you could add to that as well. It could be done, yeah. but it takes us all working yeah, together to get it done. Well, there's three things. I think there's a mindset first. We need to find the current condition intolerable. It has to be personally offensive to us. What Frederick Douglass said is where there's no struggle, there's no progress. We need to acknowledge that the work that we're in 
is requiring a struggle. We need progress, so we have to be willing to struggle. Doing things differently is scary, and it can often, often be seen as an indictment of the past. We're in an industry that has a track record. If you think of um, the American system that has been slowest to evolve in many ways, and that indeed has been tied to structural racism, you can think of three in housing, I think, is first and foremost. There's education, of course, there's healthcare, and there's housing. And I would see, and I know you do as well, Priscilla, that housing is the foundation that supports education, that supports positive health, health outcomes. At SVP, we see, we have this ethos. Mr. President, we've talked about it from years. We learned it from Toyota. This ethos of constructive discontent. We have to be hearable, but we need to embrace Frederick Douglass's notion that we cannot be satisfied. We have to be willing to struggle. And part of that is the public-private partnership. On the left, it's awfully easy to fire weapons at corporate actors. Indeed, we need to bring them in and have them be part of the solution. And we need to access at the CEO level. The relationship with Entergy occurred. Um, the CEO of that company wants his grandchildren's grandchildren to have an America that works for everybody. And we were able to create a partnership that would bring data and would allow immediate progress for our clients in St. Peter, but would also show data that would allow this to get to scale. The intention of St. Peter is for SVP to be the vanguard, but then to be open source so that other developers from our competitors, but indeed other developers that we need to be more efficient in the in industry would take this model and replicate it. We're endeavoring to replicate it in Houston. We're looking for partners there. We are looking at some affordable housing in Puerto Rico, where we've done a tremendous amount of rebuilding work, where I think 35 to 40 percent of the citizens in Puerto Rico um, are paying over 30 or 20 percent of their income uh, towards utilities. This is stuff, Mr. President, as you say, it's enraging. It can be done, but we're not going to do it by doing the same thing more. We have to be willing to do things differently. And to do so, we've got to find this current situation intolerable. And that's where I think we are with disaster resilience and recovery. This, the system is not working for anybody. It's certainly not working for people who are um, paying for their housing via rent, but it's not working for people who are paying for their housing via homeowners as well. I mean, indeed, and I want to make this point then, Mr. President, I know you have other questions. We talk about affordable housing in this country and the need for more of it. Let me share our position at SVP that the most efficient and affordable way to create affordable housing is keeping American citizens in the homes that they own. There are hundreds and thousands of American citizens who have been impacted by disaster, who could not afford market rate rent, who could not afford to buy another home. Uh, and indeed, if they're not able to rebuild their home, they're going to become both more vulnerable and more costly to the system. So America has to act with greater speed, greater predictability in getting resources faster to American citizens who own homes who can't afford to rebuild on their own. And one other, Mr. President, I know you have a question and I'm excited to answer that question. Um, but part of this is tied to the fact that we have closeted low-income people and communities of color via redlining and other American practices into the most vulnerable parts of our country. You talked about it with Secretary Fudge. And that is what I know Enterprise is fighting against. And that's what SVP is fighting against. And when you ask me the question, I'll tell you about our recovery acceleration fund. If I may, just on that, on the public-private partnership point, because it's so critical. Um, so it takes all parties on the local government. So we're working uh, with the city of Miami, for example, where very unique climate challenges in Miami in Florida. So working with the mayor, we got them to take their community de development block grant funding to fund some of these adaptation practices to fortify the housing that is currently there and anything that's newly built. Similarly, we're working in Puerto Rico. Since uh, Hurricane Maria in 2017, Enterprise actually uh, is working with HUD to build the capacity. I mean, it is a, I happen to be Puerto Rican, by the way, so this one is very real to me. It's how many years now since Hurricane Maria? The island is still struggling. So how do we build the capacity to rebuild that island and to build it responsibly? And honestly, there's some places that maybe they shouldn't rebuild in. So there's this whole issue of 
climate refugees that I think we need to talk about of where we should be rebuilding. That's a whole other conversation. But the private sector is also critical. I mentioned philanthropy. That's how enterprise got green communities off the ground because of our philanthropic partners. In disaster, um, we recently, working with Morgan Stanley, uh, have a, a disaster recovery accelerator fund where you know when a disaster hits, FEMA is there initially, but we are, our government programs at the federal level are very well intentioned when it comes to disaster recovery, but they're very slow. And it can take two or three years before the money actually gets on the ground. So working with Morgan Stanley, I, you mentioned, I was delighted that you all talked about the Community Reinvestment Act. As part of their CRA responsibilities, we went to Morgan Stanley and said, can you bridge the money that comes from community development, block grant, disaster recovery, the uh, CDBG DR program. And we are now working with three states, um, Iowa, Louisiana, and uh, Oregon. Um, and it's what's great about it, it's different, it's different uh, weather events. It's the heat, um, it's the flooding, and to see if we could accelerate how this money gets on the ground. Our goal is to make that permanent, but again, the private sector, I think, plays a very big role in this, and building codes. I think city and, and state governments, the Secretary Fudge mentioned it, it should be like non-negotiable. Any new development that we're building in this country should be built with climate resiliency in mind. For things that are already built are a little bit trickier, but new construction, that should be something that city and state governments, that should be sort of, you know, table stakes. Um, so I just want to just share that the, the public-private partnerships is so critical to make this work happen. First of all, I uh, thank you. You answered, both of you did in great detail. The question, because <clears throat> maybe it's just because I'm so old now, but <laughs> I cannot believe how long it takes our society to do the self-evident, particularly if it's good business and good economics. And we seem to be getting in gear now, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you a slightly uh, different question. Uh, mostly when we talk about this, we talk about the dangers of rising waters and storms and hurricanes and, but I think it's important to realize, you know, we just lost over a thousand homes in Boulder, Colorado because of an out of control wildfire. And uh, uh, two friends of mine who've been friends of mine for decades, lost their home and everything they'd accumulated over 60 years. And uh, I just am worried that we're not doing all this stuff fast enough, and what I was gonna ask you is, and it is to be rather specific, uh, you said some really important things about how building codes are important, I agree with that. And uh, there are financial issues, we need the financing here, but it it is much, much more uh, economically attractive to make these investments, uh, both because of the rising costs of the damage and the lowering costs of the technologies over the last decade. Uh, but I, what about the utilities? Are, are, is there a dramatic difference from place to place in the United States in the willingness of the utilities to contribute to this solving the problem? And if so, kind of what, should there be a national standard of some kind that can be more explicit and more effective? Mr. President, maybe I, I can be quick and then I'll share with Priscilla. Um, you talked about something that I think is crucial, Mr. President, which is speed. The speed between disaster and recovery is the biggest driver of whether American citizens are gonna be pushed beyond their breaking point or whether they're gonna be able to rebuild their homes and their lives and their community. And you talked about why don't we change? Uh, right now, you made the point, Mr. President, that it takes two to 12 years for the federal dollars to hit the ground to be usable by people who owned homes before disaster. That just doesn't work. And you challenged us, Mr. President, when we were in New York together on an anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, 
he said to me, Zach, don't let this happen. Don't let this be like Ron. And to tell you the truth, until now we've failed you. We haven't driven system change. We've rebuilt thousands of houses across the country. We haven't driven system change. However, um, with a partner from uh, Enterprise, who was a member of the Obama administration, SBP is launching uh, what we're calling the Recovery Acceleration Fund, which is going to reduce by years the amount of time it takes for low-income homeowners to be able to rebuild their homes after a disaster. Right now, you know, the CDBG funds that occurred within your administration that are as nimble as can be during non-disaster time, or rather delayed during disaster time, it takes two or three years to hit the ground. There is a reimbursement pathway that works extraordinarily well. So people who can self-fund, rebuild their homes, and then three, four, five, six years later are able to seek reimbursement from the states or the cities for that federal money. Uh, you challenged us, you said, Zach, you say you're a disruptor, do it differently. Well, this spring we are launching in partnership or with the blessing of Governor Bell Edwards in Louisiana and uh, HUD says it's appropriate. Uh, we're launching this recovery acceleration fund, which is exactly what you just talked about, a public private partnership where um, ESG investments, impact investments can be made into a fund that will be lent to low-income homeowners who would eventually qualify for those CDBG dollars, allow them to avail themselves of the reimbursement pathway that works so well for people with means and to rebuild their houses um, within you know, eight to 24 months rather than month 25 to, I can't do 12 times eight years, but years and years down the road. We're thrilled that that's gonna be launching this spring and we know it's something um, that folks who follow you would be interested in learning more about and investing. I'd love to have an offline conversation with your team about that. That's sort of in our wheelhouse. You know, we try to bring public-private partnerships together and get philanthropic and other groups involved. And I also think that if you're looking at the community level, that sometimes individual donors can even make a difference there. If, and so I think it's really important to know because we get these ideas and then we see the technology works and we forget that the delivery systems haven't been modified. Or we depend upon people like you to go back and do all the heavy lifting when the cameras have moved on to the next problem and nobody wants to figure out what the difference between rhetoric and reality is. So I'm very, I'm grateful to all of you, but you've given me some good ideas today and I think to others who will be listening. Go ahead, Priscilla, what were you gonna say? Yeah, so Mr. President, you are spot on um, on the utilities uh, in terms of getting them to focus on the transition, particularly for lower income individuals and to bring their voices to the conversation. We're currently working, for example, with the Los Angeles Power and uh, Energy Department to do just this. Um, I think one thing that utilities can do is share data. Um, you know, share mission information, share at the address level. Is this working? Talk about transmission, talk about their vulnerabilities and their infrastructure. Um, what is it costing the individual at the household level? So you are spot on. This is a very critical issue. Um, there's some utilities that perhaps um, might get in the way of some of the renewable energy uh, innovations that are going on because they might have conflict. So it is a very big issue and bringing them to the table is critical. And data and sharing that information is critical. It's an infrastructure issue as well. Uh, another thing we haven't talked about that uh, uh, the more moving parts you have, the more some sort of embedded cost may be a barrier to change. I'll give you just a, an example that uh, after Superstorm Standy. Uh, I think it was afterward. It could have been right before. Uh, I was working with Mayor Bloomberg in New York to try to do some things that both there and with something called the C40s group around the world. And 
the only thing he ever asked me to do that we fell on our face was to retrofit all the public housing units to make them as resilient as possible and also as efficient as possible. And I couldn't figure out what the heck the problem was because you think, well, there's more direct public control over these units and other things. But they had, it turned out they had a lot of embedded long-term contracts for the provision of electricity that they couldn't figure out how to work around. Now, that's not a criticism. I'm just giving you an example of what we're all facing. So the things you have said today should be both enlightening and in some ways encouraging, and in other ways just urging to people who care about this subject. Uh, before we wrap up, and we're out of time, but if you have one last point, if you, if you were talking to uh, someone who really cares about this, who said, if there's one thing that I could do to help you, what one thing would that be? If you could wave a magic wand and one thing would change, what would it be? What would the two of you say? What SPP would say would be fund the Recovery Acceleration Fund in Louisiana and bring it to scale across the country. Does not have to be led by SPP. We want to show that it works and that it is then the model for residential owner-occupied post-disaster recovery. That's what's best for American populace. Thanks. Priscilla? If you could help enterprise build more resilient communities together with building better futures for everyone. We can do this. We can do this with the right mindset, with everyone working together, bring this, all this to scale. We can do it together. The technology is there. The will has to be there too. Bless you. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Great work.